Happy Mother's Day. I know Tim Morello already welcomed you and told you Happy Mother's Day, but let me say it again. Happy Mother's Day. It's good to see you this morning, see you here. You look so pretty and all handsome and everything. Some of y'all hadn't looked this good in days. <laughs> Amen. I know some are probably here out of excitement, joy, some out of duress, but we're glad you're here either way you came. <laughs> It's a great day. It's a great day to celebrate. I want to share with you a, a sermon I've titled, Making Mama Happy. You know, that, you know, you can join with me. If Mama ain't happy, I said, if Mama ain't happy, well, you know, there's a lot of things from different mamas make different mamas happy, but we're going to talk about from the sense of a biblical mama today. And as we celebrate Mother's Day, what really gladdens the heart of a mother who loves the Lord. And I want to share with you today a passage that... Uh, um, my brothers and sisters are here, a few of us today, and uh, those that aren't here of all are be familiar with this passage of Scripture because if you're like me at all, uh, Mama sent it to you. And uh, if you are blessed enough to have a godly mama, she probably have shared this Scripture with you sometime uh, recently as well. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. That passage was penned on little cards and notes and letters and passages of Scripture over the years from my mom, not only to me, but brothers and sisters in our family because this truly was the passion of her heart, what would really make her happy. And we're going to look at that passage of Scripture today. I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. Now, this letter was from a gentleman, a, the Apostle John, who's approximately close to 100 years of age when he pins this to the church and to Gaius and to those in the church as he wrote the elect lady, the church. And he speaks to them about their testimony and what he's hearing about their testimonies. And he's praising the Lord. He's rejoicing, at least in part, because there's another part where there's another brother down there, apparently, who may not be a brother, who, uh, who goes by the name of brother, but who's not acting like a brother. And he, he, rec he recommends Gaius to not have fellowship with him at this point, that he needs to get his act together. But in speaking to the church as a whole and to Gaius, his brother in Christ, I, I'm so excited to hear from others about your testimony and your walk in Christ that you're having, and it's a great joy to me. Now, I know that as a pastor, and years before that as an evangelist, to, to hear from people who are still walking in the truth. In fact, now I sat down here on the front row, and there's a lady I haven't seen in 30-something years, Juanita Emshoff, who used to come out years and years ago uh, to the Vine Ministries and bring her children. They were probably there under a few weekends under duress as well, but... <laughs> Bring, bring him out to hear the gospel and to, to hear the word preached on the weekends. Uh, there's a joy that comes from knowing that people you haven't seen perhaps in a long time or haven't been acquainted with for years are still living for Jesus and still going on with God and still love Christ and, and, the, and the church and the Bible and the fellowship of the saints. It is a great joy as a pastor, you know. And now at the same time, it's kind of a sad when to hear if you're not walking in the truth, Amen. But to hear that, and that's the, the heart of what he's saying here, that to know that you're still walking in the truth and that you're still attempting in your hearts and in your lives to honor the Lord and to serve the Lord with your life. That brings the joy of the heart to a mom, to a, to a pastor, to, to the teacher, like, like uh, the Apostle John was, to hear that, it's, that the children of God are walking in the truth today. I really believe that's the heart true as, to, to, as of, a, of a believing mom as well, that she can look at her family and look at them and say, hey, they are there, whether it's a parent or a pastor or mother, whoever, they're there and they're still walking in the Lord of what they heard. I mean, it's exciting to me as a, as a pastor, as a parent, to know that my children are living the truth. You know, I was there when my children, you know, were baptized and prayed their sinner's prayer and all those things, but it's another thing to, to look at their life. And this is the heart of what I want to talk to you about today. I You'll be glad to know for perhaps some of you, this is not a real lengthy message this morning, but I think it's a very important message. So I really hope you'll lock in here with me for a few minutes because there's more power and there's more importance in these few words that I'll be sharing this morning than what, than what you may realize. There's really three components that I want to talk about in this particular verse that are here. One I want to talk about is this parent. It's really important to point out to, as far as John's regard in his life, of this man who walked with God, who served the Lord, who suffered greatly for the Lord, who experienced all kinds of, uh, of martyrdom against him and, and against the Lord for his faith in Christ, but he still keeps persevering. And he's pointing out what it is to me as a man, he says, who loves God with all my heart, mind, soul, and body and strength, who loves the Word of God, who loves Jesus, that I have people who are still following what I've been teaching them after you know this, this time has elapsed and if time has gone by. But I think the truth is for any person, any parent, 
any mom who loves the Lord to look at her family and to look at his children and say, hey, my kids are walking with the Lord. They've been faithful. It's one thing as a parent and as a mom to put these things in your kids' hearts and to raise them. And, and, and motherhood is a constant act of discipleship where you're constantly pouring things into your children's life. And it really doesn't end when they leave home. You're still constantly doing that. I know that my mom was constantly pouring things into the life of her, her children. Faithful to teach them the Word of God, faithful to believe the Word of God, faithful to, to, to leave a heritage in our lives of a parent who spoke the truth and spoke the Word of God into our lives. And a parent and a mom or a dad even, but a mom especially who's going to live for Jesus and constantly place these things in her children's heart is going to be a mom who's going to find full satisfaction in her life. It may not come immediately, but God is faithful to his word. You can be sure that God is, will honor your prayers and God, will, God hears what you're saying. And all those things you pray in regard to your children and to your family and praying and believing God for, all those things that you know according to the will of God, you should take an absolute confidence today in that God hears your prayer. The Bible says if we ask anything according to his will, we know that God hears us and gives to us the petitions. He grants those petitions to us that we have requested him. Why? Because they're according to his will. It doesn't always happen in the time we want it to happen in, but God is faithful. Praise God for moms who are faithful to teach the word of God to the children. But even more than that, faithful are moms who not just teach the word of God to their children, but for those who live the word of God to their children. It's one thing to have instruction from words, all right, and from books. It's another thing to see that instruction from the word lived out in a heart and lived out in a life to know that they are living by faith. When the Bible talks about raising your children in the admonition of the Lord, it goes far beyond teaching Bible verses to your children. That's important. It's the basis of which they'll build their life on but to live those Bible verses out in front of them. I had a mom, praise God, who did that. Well, I should say I have a mom. She's with the Lord. She's not absent, or just to, except in the presence here. She's not absent in the presence of the Lord. But to, to have that as that kind, of, that kind of building stone and that foundation, someone who not just knew it and spoke it, but believed it enough to live it. One thing about my mom, she wasn't shy about her faith. You know, she, she didn't care who knew about it. In fact, she was concerned that people did know about it. You know, that she believed that we are salt and that we are the light of the world and we should shine like light, that we are a city that's set on a hill and we should not be ashamed of that, nor should we seek to hide who we are in Christ, but to live it. My mom, I knew, was a believer, but my friends knew my mom was a believer. And my neighbors knew my mom was a believer. Everybody in the church knew my mom was a believer. Not in word only, but in action. Never, ever, if you really want to teach your children ever hide out in public what you're teaching in private. You live it out in public. So here's a mom who not only believed it, but lived it, who wants to live it fully and was faithful to live the word before others. But listen to this. John is, John is writing this letter based upon something that he's heard. Now, I don't believe he's just kind of catching that somebody's come by and they're talking about the church and Gaius and these particular people in this short little letter here. I believe he is faithful to investigate. Now, we have in our, our house a little thing we told our children very early on, you know, that there's no secrets here. We have the FBI actively engaged in our home. It's the Family Bureau of Investigation. How many parents believe in the Family Bureau of Investigation? That means that you know and you dig and you, you find out what's going on in the life of your kids. You don't just take their word for it. How many do you know that little children are a bunch of liars? <laughs> and sometimes those little children grow up to be adult liars. You take the time to investigate. I believe the apostles are asking, what's going on with so-and-so? You were there? Okay, well, tell me what happened that there's this process of really wanting to know, are my children walking in the truth? Are they listening? Are they sensitive to what the Spirit of God is saying to them? Are they pursue, pursuing God's will for their life? Do, you know, listening, to find out, to listen for a report. And what a joy and what an excitement it really becomes when they hear a good report. But let me say on the other hand, what a bummer. What heartbreak. What heartache to know that you who've invested so much time and commitment and prayer into your child's life 
is not hearing it. They're not, re- they're not regarding it. The most important thing to you in all the world is your, is your walk with God and your faith in Christ, first and foremost, which is what gave life and abundance to your family setting, that that most important thing to you is not important to them at all. And it's being disregarded for whatever reason for sin, for slothfulness, for just, you know, just a different heart, a different attitude, a different path, whatever it is, it still brings sorrow and it still brings heartache to, the, to, to a parent's life. You know, it's, it's, it's one thing that when children are at home, most of the time, for the most part, they'll, they'll seek to satisfy you, you know, and to make mom and dad happy, you know, and, and to just make sure that everything's going along. But when they get away from home, well, I discovered this, I spend a lot more time praying for my family who's now away from home than I did when they were with me at home. A whole lot more time. How many parents can agree to that? All right, you, you know that's a fact. You spend more time, and you spend more time on your knees. And I really didn't discover that, you know, until I became a parent, and then a parent whose kids left the home. That's when I went back to my mama and apologized. <laughs> on my knees, please, please forgive me for being so rebellious and so unattentive and so uncaring that, you know, that I just lived the way I did. I didn't care what anybody thought, didn't care what anybody think, and I, I didn't realize how I was hurting you and how I was impacting your life and upsetting you and causing you to spend extra time on your face before God. Please, please forgive me. That's a moment of revelation we all need to have because at, at our heart, we all are very selfish, amen? Well, three of us are. We're all very selfish. We all want our way. Our way is more important than anybody else's way. And when we live in that kind of little world where everything revolves around us and others aren't that important, it's just important that they know, recognize, and see and understand me. Well, listen, you're not the center of the universe, all right? And the only way you really discover who the center of the universe is is when you discover Jesus and you start letting him impact your life. Because, listen, this little world we live in don't let this pass. This is short. It's over soon, all right? I'm like 134 now. It seems that way, all right? I got old, and it, I, I don't know about you, but I got old real fast. Anybody else get old real fast? I mean, like at 30, all of a sudden it's downhill. <laughs> Took me forever to reach 30, but after that, boom, man, it's, that was yesterday. That was another world. When we start discovering, hey, this, this, whole, this whole thing's not about me. It's just not about me. It's not all about me. It's about God, His will, and how He wants to use me in this world and use me in life, use me in my family. And so what happens is, he, in this regard, you know, you want to be someone who doesn't bring tears of sorrow to the people who have loved you more than anybody else has loved you, who've committed themselves to you. Yeah, you say, well, my parents weren't perfect. Well, join the club. All right, they don't make perfect parents anymore than they make perfect kids. I'm sure you were the perfect kid, right? Amen. Well, you don't know. Don't give me all that, all right? Just quit wasting my time and your time with excuses and start manning up and being a woman and being a man and realizing, hey, you're here to make somebody else's life different. It's not all about you. So here's how you want to bring joy. And, and if you'll catch this, this the second point is, is passion. What, what brings the joy here? What's all this joy about? It? He said, I, you know, I, I, I have no greater joy. I mean, I can have joy about a lot of stuff. I, you know, I have joy about a million different things in life. But this is the apostle Paul. And he said, I mean, John, he said, listen, I have no greater joy than this. to know that, hey, that my investment in your life has made a difference. That's kind of what it gets down to. That my investment in the kingdom of God and the work of God and the will of God is making a difference. That's the, that's the greatest joy that I can have. You know, this, this is, uh, by the way, it's the joy of someone who, who loves the Lord. This is the joy of someone who, who loves God and his word, who loves God's children. Here's the joy of a person who's been faithful to teach and to instruct and to disciple and to mentor. Whatever word you want to use, it's all the same to disciple somebody and raise them in what we call the admonition of the Lord. This person has a passion. What is the passion? It's to know that your, your life is being impacted and the difference is being made. But catch the way he said, I have no greater joy than this. What? To know that my children are walking in the truth. He didn't say, you know, I have no greater joy than to, than to know that my children are informed about the truth. He's done that. We do that. Moms, you do that. You're informing your children about truth. And, but here's the joy. 
not to know that they're just informed. I was probably one of the most informed kids around, but didn't walk in truth. You have all the information. There's a lot of people with information, but they've not been changed. They've never experienced a transformation where the truth literally changes their mind and their heart. And many times they don't realize that the power of God that has been placed by the Word of God in their life, there's such a transforming power in that Word that if you will trust it and you'll receive it and you'll believe it, you can be changed supernaturally. That's the power of God's Word. I mean, how many people make this excuse? Well, I just can't live that way. No, you can't. Nobody can. But the Word of God changes you, and when it's implanted in your life and you start receiving it and choosing to believe it and to trust it, then the supernatural work of God's Holy Spirit is loosed in your life, and you'll be different. And what he's saying is that here's people who are my children. They're not just getting the information. They haven't just learned the lessons and gave the right answers because a lot of people know the right answers, but he said they're walking in it. Walk deals with progress. Walk deals with maturing. Walk deals with going forward. They're not stagnant. Their lives are being changed and they're being influenced by the power of God and they're making an influence. You know, there has to come a day. Let me speak to the children just for a moment. And I are one, all right? There has to come a day when the apostle put it this way. Paul said, you know, I put away childish things. There has to come a day when you decide to grow up. You can't be a child and act like an infant all your life. You're going to have to realize that, again, as I said earlier, the world doesn't revolve around your life. That you're here by the grace of God, for the glory of God to make a difference in your life. But if it's all about you and what makes you have fun and what makes you feel good and what makes you be excited and what makes your little clock tick, whatever it might be, if that's all, your life's empty and you're going, to be, you're going to grow old and be a miserable old person and you're going to grow old and be a miserable old person all by yourself. But John's saying, hey, there's somebody who's not going to live that kind of life. They're, they're hearing it. They're doing it. They're believing it. They're trusting it, and God is changing and transforming their world. That brings me joy. And again, let me reiterate, the opposite is true. When you don't see progress, when you don't see your kids being changed, then that doesn't bring you much joy. So you have this parent, this mother, a father, the apostle, a teacher, Somebody who's putting something and investing something in their, their, their lives and in someone else's lives and their family's lives. There's a joy that comes from that, and the joy comes from seeing what they have deposited into their heart make an incredible difference in those lives. So they aren't just gathering information. They're being transformed by what they're hearing and what they're seeing, which brings me to the, the, that part of the progeny. Again, these just aren't informed children. Their lives are being changed. Their lives are being affected by the Spirit of God. Their parents weren't perfect. Their mom wasn't perfect. Their dad's not perfect. And neither are they perfect, but they're walking in the right direction. They're moving in the right way. How heartbreaking can it be for a parent than a child who's just you know, just living for themselves and has no desire to live for God, and they just see that, that attitude of just, it's all about me and that selfish concern in their life. But how different it is when a parent sees a child who starts making decisions for God, and no matter what part of their life they're in, whether they're a child, a teenager, an adult, wherever they may be, anytime there's a, a move of the Spirit of God in their life, when a godly mom sees that or a godly dad sees that in their life, it thrills them with a greater joy. That God, I see God moving in that heart. I see God moving in that life. I mean, it was exciting when my children prayed to receive Jesus. I remember those days. I remember baptizing my children. And that was a great joy for me. That was a great excitement for me. But I remember even with greater joy the times in their life when they come to those encounters with God. When it's no longer mom's Jesus or dad's Jesus but it's their Jesus. When God's doing something in their life, when they give a report, here's what the Spirit of God's teaching me, here's what God's doing in my heart, here's the way God's leading me right now, here's how God's instructing my life. I'm hearing from God, I'm starting to respond to God. That's, that is the, the moments of great satisfaction and great joy, why? Because they're walking in truth. 
Proverbs 19, verse 13 has a very strong verse. Listen to it. It's a verse that would break your heart. It says, a foolish son is a destruction to his father and his mother. Now, that could be a son or a daughter, all right. But a foolish child. What is a foolish child? Well, according to Proverbs, it's somebody who's not on the right path. It's somebody who's not pursuing the right course. It's somebody who's not going the right direction. They've chosen their own will and their own way, no matter what truth is, no matter what God says. I want what I want. I want what the world wants. I want what's acceptable to the rest of the world. I just want what I want. And you miss God completely when you choose that path in life. How many times does the Spirit of God speak to our lives? I had a, one of, a man write me this week. He said, I know what God wants me to do, but I don't want to do it. I just can't find any joy in, in, in making this decision. I'm going to make it anyway. But when do we ever start gauging our life by making the right decisions on based on how it makes me feel? We do what's right because it's right. We make right choices no matter what our feelings are. Our feelings are deceptive. Our feelings can mislead us every time. We do what's right because it's right. That's where integrity comes in. And that's where this, this whole idea about walking comes through. But the most heartbreaking thing Proverbs says is to see this. And, and, and this whole issue of the book of Proverbs, we've been teaching to it for over a year now. But in Proverbs, here's a father who's instructing his son saying, this is right and this is right and this is wrong and this is wrong. Avoid this and choose this and believe this and reject this. He just gives all these this consistent principles of living a life so that you have a full, satisfactory, meaningful, joyful life, not one that's going to invite destruction. As he said here, he leaves a path of destruction. On the other hand, we see in the same book of Proverbs that son, that daughter, who consistently makes the right choice for Jesus Christ every time. Now, it's possible. Listen to me as I talk about this progeny. It's possible to have a reputation that may be good amongst believers. But that's just, reputation is kind of what you are when you're around people. But we're talking about something far deeper than having a good name among the crowd. I had a good name among the crowd growing up in the church I grew up in. Well, they just thought I was just as spiritual as I could be. Is that all the youth events? And we had a youth choir, sang in the youth choir, and did all the right things for the youth, and showed up here and showed up there, and, you know, just... You know, just so sweet, sing a special in church. My, my, isn't he a godly young man? I was as far this thing away from being a godly young man as you can imagine. A reputation among those folks, but my character was defiled and defective. But when I got right with God, something changes. And your life changes. And God changes your life. As a parent, you may be here today, as a mom here today, and you have children who've gotten right with God. You may have some children who haven't gotten right with God. But you still may remain true to the Word of God. You still remain faithful to the principles of God's Word. You still keep believing God. You know, there are times and, you know, when, when God just works in, in our ways, unique ways, and then we have to deal with this issue of rebellious hearts and rebellious lives. But I want you to know God is faithful. I think my mom finally got to see before she meant to, to stand in the presence of Jesus, all of her children come to a place of real faith and commitment to Christ Jesus. I believe we can do that. Don't give up. Don't become heartless. Don't look at the way they live their lives. Just keep praying and just keep believing and just keep holding on. I was reading from the passage here in one of my commentaries by Spurgeon, and he was making a comment to parents who have children, some who are saved and some who are lost, and he was saying this. He said, Beloved, have you some of your children converted while others remain unsaved? I charge you, let what the Lord has done for some encourage you concerning the rest of your children. When you're on your knees in prayer, say to your heavenly Father, Lord, you have heard me for part of my house, so I beseech you, therefore, to look in favor upon all my house, for I could not bear that any of my children should choose to remain your enemies or pursue the road which leads to hell. You have made me very glad very glad with a full belief that a portion of my dear ones can walk in the truth. But I am sad because I can see from the conduct of the other of my children that they have not yet changed in their heart. And therefore, they do not keep your statutes. Lord, let my whole house eat of the Paschal Lamb, which means give their life to Jesus, and come with me out of Egypt through thy grace. Amen. Don't give up praying. God is faithful. Don't give up trusting. God is faithful. You know, when I was just a kid, I remember us all gathering around Mama, asking Mama, you know, it was usually about Friday or Saturday before Mother's Day. We really prepared. 
Mama, what do you want for Mother's Day? What do you want for Mother's Day? And, you know, like a bunch of little hens gathering around their mama hen, you know, the little chicks gathering around the mama hen. We're all sitting there with our little beaks up. What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? Yeah, what do you want, Mama? Yeah, what do you want, Mama? Mama, just take a big, deep breath every Mother's Day Eve and say something like this. You know, I really don't want any gifts, but what I do want is for you just all to get along. Six of us with eight different opinions. Christy always had two of her own. <laughs> you want two from eight. Just, you know, listen, I know some of you get frustrated when you see sibling rival going, hey, it, just expect it. it. In home is where your kids learn how to live out in the world and relate to others. But isn't that it? Just, 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 just make some right to choices. Choose to love one another. Choose to receive one another. Just seek to get along. Make mama happy. Well, the best way to get along is to get along down the road of life with Jesus. That's the way you get along with God. That's the way you get along with each other. That's the way you're going to get a long way in life. Hallelujah. Let's stand with our heads bowed.